The line between a Christian saint and a pagan god has never been quite as clear as people think. This is one of the reasons why some Protestants are very up in arms about Catholicism, but, oh, it's, it's not, it's not just them. A lot of pagan thought has crept into all of the Christianities. It's not a bad thing. We're going to talk about some of the saints that have bridged the gap back and forth, as well as how that ebb and flow tends to keep happening and is currently happening again in a major way as we walk together down creation's lines. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie, I am a crystal pagan druid and priest of Bridget. Hello everyone, my name is Brian, I am a crystal pagan druid and sous chef to the Dagda. Today we're going to be talking about saints, which I love talking about saints. We're going to be talking about gods and we're going to be talking about this kind of ebb and flow and how we can do it in our own life. Because you notice we always say the word Christo pagan because yeah, I wrote an entire Christo pagan manifesto. In fact, I wrote two of them. You can find them over at wisdomscry.com. You can also find them over at creationsfast.com if you want to dig deeper into the topic of what is a Christo pagan. Before we get into all that, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology happens to be on the app you're currently listening to us on. We do original Christo Pagan and Druid episodes five days a week, Monday through Friday. And you don't want to miss anything because we got a lot of stuff coming in the future. So I'm not going to go through the long definition of Christian and Pagan and Christo Pagan. I have done that on previous episodes. If you want to do a deep dive into that, we, we've done those. So we can check that out. I think it's very important to make a distinction here between folk religion and uh, let's call it clerical religion because it technically of the reformation and a ways into the reformation. So we're talking about like the 1600s people were only religious if they had taken holy orders. The only technically religious people in Europe were priests, nuns, monks, friars, and the lot. If you were not a priest, a monk, a nun, you were not religious. This is where you will hear this terminology about the priesthood, the clergy, and the laity. Yeah, the laity was everybody else. Maybe if they were lucky, they would find a point in their life where they would go and join a convent or a monastery. And you actually see this in many regions that towards the end of one's life, they would join monastery. It never really became a common practice, but this is very important because what this means is what we think of as the history of Christianity is the history of clerical religion. And we have very few records of actual folk religion, what people were doing. In fact, the few records we do have about what people were doing are because Oopsie Doodle, a non-clerical person, ended up becoming a saint because they were so revered that the church had to co-opt them or bring, bring their following into the fold somehow. Or the church decided this group has to be destroyed, so we're going to go after them. That's really the only time we get to really see what folk practice kind of looked like. Because most of what we have are letters of priests, monks, and nuns debating. If you're in the Orthodox Church, it's primarily the monks debating amongst each other with occasional letters from the metropolitans and bishops and priests. But it's primarily the monks over there. We don't have a lot of the folk practices. And I bring that up because for what we do about folk practices... They have always been special. For example, during first temple sort of period in Jerusalem and surrounding areas, from the archaeology, we know two things. Most people seem to have their own stone replica of the Ark of the Covenant in their house. They all had a stone box that they kept in their house, and it generally had two to three statues on top of it. One was definitely an Asherah. So for all of the proclamations of the monotheism of the period, if you know your history, we know that this was a henotheistic period, but yeah, yeah, it was definitely a henotheistic period. And we also know that as Christianity spread, while we find churches, we find in people's homes crosses and statues of Thor and Bridget and Odin and stuff still kind of lingering about. So on the folk level, this kind of Christopagan mixture was very common, much more common than we know, just because average people's lives are not well recorded in history. Then we have St. Christopher. I have to start with St. Christopher because St. Christopher boggles my mind. If you've ever seen St. Christopher medal 
or some of those little statues that people put in their cars. That's not St. Christopher. That is sanitized, modern St. Christopher. Tell me more. So the original St. Christopher wasn't human at all. But he's carrying a small child on his shoulder. That's a human. That's a full grown adult. So he's a giant? He is not only a giant, he's a giant with a dog's head. There was this belief in the Middle Ages that there were people who had dog heads, the cynocephaly, and they were widely believed to be monsters. Think of them like proto-werewolves. They, they have a lot of the characteristics that we see of werewolves later in stories. They're people with wolf or dog heads that are very often eating other people, attacking caravans and just eating the people there. These, all the things you've ever heard about a werewolf applies to these people. But see, there was one good one, and his name was Christopher. He lived in a cave by a raging river and would help people across back and forth. They would pay him a toll. He would put them on his shoulder and he would just walk across this raging river because him's a giant. He would carry people back and forth and he even rescued some people who had fell in the river and almost drowned and he really good guy, this dog-headed giant man, <laughs> Christopher. Eventually, once the belief in the dog-headed people went away, the imagery of him changes drastically, but he's still a giant until he's not. And it, it does in some later depictions become a child because once people stop believing that giants were in the world... <laughs> Well, he's carrying somebody, and proportionally, that has to be a child, so I guess it's a child now. So, yes, some of the depictions you may have seen of him is him carrying a child. Now, I cannot prove at all that St. Christopher is connected to any earlier European mythos at all. He's like Krampus. He's something that shows up and does not appear to be connected to anything. By the way, anybody who tells you that Krampus is connected to old pagan lore is lying to you. That's a Nazi lie that was created in the 1930s by them. So don't repeat their propaganda. Thank you. There's no historical evidence for that claim. We have no sign of him before, I think, 1700s, maybe the 1500s, but that's more the pest. But that, that's neither here nor there. Knowing that there were a lot of Greek characters that were dog-headed heroes, that the, the whole dogman myth does kind of come from Greek paganism, I'm including him on this list because the dog-headed men stories do come to us from Roman and Greek paganism and then just get adopted fully into Christianity. Like, of course there are people running around that have dog faces. Of course there are dog people. Why wouldn't there be dog people? So that's St. Christopher. I, I, I like my saints weird. I really do. And I want to normalize dog-headed giant St. Christopher. <laughs> He is the ultimate really good boy. When you're mythologizing things and you're thinking about traveling, being in strange places, what would be more comforting than that loyal companion and a giant who's so big and strong will protect from everything bad and scare off bad things? The imagery and all, it does fit, even if practicalities of it is, I love a good cryptid, but that, that really even stretches for me. Ten foot increased. Yeah. Actually, when you look at the proportions, he'd have to be a bit bigger than that. Yeah, probably 15, 20. Yeah, I was trying to shrink him down, but yeah, he's yeah. probably more like 15 or 20 because that is probably at least a five foot tall person yeah. sitting on his shoulder, yeah. tiny like that. Because like, if it's a full of gr grown adult, you know. At least. Yeah. I, I like my saints weird. What can I say? I also feel like we should do an honorable mention to all of the angels because for the most part, the vast majority of them were part of the free monotheism pan pantheon they they were elim yeah and elim a bunch of monks sat around debating like well we had this pantheon what do we do with them avengers assemble they're not gods they're angels they're lesser beings even though the scripture clearly calls them gods so i mean technically they're they're ancient israelite a lot of them are ancient israelite deities I don't even want to get into Metatron and the whole are there two gods controversy of the first three centuries. But if you want to go down a really fun rabbit hole, there was a whole debate of how many gods are there. It usually set, centered around Metatron, whether Metatron was a second god. Fun, fun reading. But I, I don't know how pagan we would call some of that. I know the detractors call all of it pagan heathenry. But and for those whose brains are trying to wrap their heads around this, I mean, you can think of it like a debate over... You have your general manager, and then you have your assistant manager, 
And that number two, as far as management goes, is there any difference between them technically? Actually, when you read the text, it's more owner manager. Oh yeah. Okay. There you go. Yeah. I guess even better for, for those that have experience more in that private sector, or, yeah. you know, where you have a hands-on owner and a manager and it's just like, uh, you know, for the daily lives of the, of the regular working crew, how much difference is that really? And so we've talked a lot about St. Bridget and I'm not going to belabor my love of my beloved Bridget. We've talked about her quite, quite a bit, but we would be remiss not to mention her or pretty much the entire pantheon of saints that cluster around her that all do appear to have some connection to the Irish pantheon. I would be here all day if I started listing them off. And then we have the asterisk, like the big asterisk character, which is who you wanted to talk about, St. Francis, because I don't know how to understand St. Francis other than he was practicing Italian witchcraft and became a saint. I like to think of him as one of the OG exam known examples of a Christo pagan, just because when you really get into the history of St. Francis and stuff and the stories of St. Francis, it's like, wow, that dude was a Christo pagan way before the term Christo pagan was a thing. The, the way he did his healing work, the way that he talked to the birds and the animals and everything. He has all of the hallmarks that you would find in someone practicing a very, there's, there is no way of getting around the fact that he was practicing an earth centered religion. Yeah. Like he yeah. was an earth based re religion that he was practicing and proclaiming. Even on the Christianity side, his Christianity was very much that I, okay, this is what Christ said. I'm following Christ's teachings and all the other stuff is just whatever for whomever. He seemed to really just like all the rest of the baggage, especially all the imperial baggage. He was just like, if really you want to carry that luggage, you can carry that luggage. I'm not carrying that luggage. You have fun. Do you In his admonitions, he clearly states that if you listen to a religious superior and do something bad, you're still going to hell. There's no, I was yeah. just following orders, heaven. Like you don't, yeah. you don't get a get out of the bad place card because you were just following orders even from the like, like you always have to follow your own conscience and obedience is never an excuse to do bad things and especially for his time like because it's really hard to remember when he lived because he does transcend a lot of the expectations of his time in a lot of his thoughts and doctrine but yeah I, I, it's hard not to see him in this light especially like read the canticle of the creatures if you've never said this prayer or encountered this prayer, this is where he goes through all of the, the, the creatures and they are, you know, brother sun and sister moon and, you know, bro brother fire and sister water and, you know, bro bro brother wind and sister mother earth. And, you know, this, this is very, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to escape that feel from him. I think it's one of the reasons why he is quite beloved amongst those of us who practice both Christianity and very earth-based spiritualities. The one class of beings that is almost impossible to talk about because we don't know where they came from are the green men. I don't think that there is a way to have the green men without a pagan introduction. I, I don't see where else they get into the faith without them coming from the surrounding Celtic mythology in which they were born but they don't correlate directly to any of them. So we can't say, oh, the green man is this Scottish God, Irish God, Welsh God, because they don't seem to correlate that way. They seem to have become a class of being, and they are all vegetal in that we see the leaves and the ivy and everything growing off of them. Some of them give me very strong Carnunos vibes or Lord of the Hunt type vibes, because if you look at them, those could be branches coming off their head, or they could be antlers or horns, or they could be wooden horns. They're an interesting class of being. Take a moment and talk a little bit about what the green men are. So the green men appear in art, primarily in the Celtic con countries. So we see them in France and Brittany, and they kind of get brought further into France from some of the early art artwork in Brittany because we forget about the large Celtic population in Brittany, because we usually only talk about the insular Celts, those that were in Britain, in Wales, and Scotland and Ireland. And in those countries, we see them as well, 
they appear most in the artwork in that they are not always men. There are a few women that are dep depicted in that you can clearly see breasts. They, they are people who are shown with leaves growing up out of their body, vines growing out of their, uh, out of their flesh. They often have a protruding tongue. They, a lot of the artwork reminds me of Medusa. And I wonder how much she contributed to the mythology of the Greek, the green men outside of the, the, maybe a Celtic interpretation of Medusa. Because if you look at the portrayals of the head of Medusa with the snakes fresh going wild for the hair, the tongue out often fangs in the mouth, very reminiscent. Like they're very similar images. We don't know if we have mythology about them because we don't have anywhere directly in writing that would say a wood was is a green man though the descriptions of the wood woes who are kind of imagine if sasquatch were made out of plants and green i guess would be these they're not quite the, like the ants from the lord of the rings but they are kind of plant-based wild men of the forest that you see in the legends they they are described in similar veins but the green men and the wood woes are not we don't see them being used as interchangeable terms. We do know that in Irish mythology that gets brought to us more clearly in stories like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, there was this kind of green deity figure who basically challenged people's understanding of death and their courage in facing death and would do this by basically challenging people. If you chop off my head in a year and a day, I get to chop off yours. And they're like, huh, I'll take that bet. And then they'd chop off his head and he'd pick it up and go, I'll see you in a year and, and walk off. And the real challenge was, do you show up to have your head chopped off or not? Are you willing to face this? You made an agreement. Are you going to keep your word? And there are some old Irish versions of the story that are very reminiscent of the stories that come later. Now, none of the descriptions of the Green Knight clearly make him a wood woes or a green man. The earlier stories, he is green. He is literally a green. The, the Green Knight is a green man. He, he His skin is described as being green. His hair is described as being green. His armor is green. Mm. Like everything about him is green. He does become more human over time. But he's a very fascinating character that may or may not be connected to these, I mean, just very powerful images of something. And a lot of mythology has ended up growing out of the imagery of the green man. This isn't stated well enough. If you've heard any mythology with the green man, it is personal gnosis. It is unsubstantiated, unverified personal gnosis because we have no stories about them from the time in which they were being carved. They are primarily carvings, which again, we know the Celts often would use masks in their ritual work. So maybe that is like by the transitive property that became these statues that would be added in decoration. We, we really don't know where they come from or what they meant. And that brings us to one of the reasons we wanted to do this episode. Because we don't know, they really can mean whatever you want them to mean. And that is true of pretty much any mythological thing. Like, if you want to see all unicorns as evil, that you do you. You know what I'm saying? Because unicorns aren't real. So you can think whatever you want to about them and incorporate them into your active imagination practice or ritual work however you want. We've done episodes on both of those previously. If you want to check out how to work with mythical beasts or active imagination, we've done episodes on both of those. But you really can do whatever you want to with them. Most people today don't need anyone to give them the permission to do that because we are doing that. The number of people that are not Christian at all that have a devotion to Mary because Mary's just like that. I know Jewish rabbis that have a deep connection to Mary and to the Black Madonna. And they are, they're not even Christian adjacent. Like they're like, Jesus was an interesting rabbi who lived in the first century. And that's like, as far as their thoughts on him go, you know what I'm saying? But Mary may, Mary something special. And I agreed. Mary is something special. As with everything, when we're doing this kind of mix mashing and when we're kind of coming up with our own understanding of things. It's important to remember that you can have your own unverified personal gnosis. You can have your own headcanon because good, good living mythology 
is headcanon that gets shared and eventually becomes other people's headcanon as well. Because that's what a vibrant mythology is. So don't be afraid to share your thoughts with other people, but don't expect anyone else to agree with, with you. And that's fine. That, that's how this should work. Like, I have very strong feelings that Danu and the Morgan are the same. Like, these pictures are the same. They're the same being. That when I say Danu, I am talking about the Morgan. But the Morgan is her formal role. That is her as the spirit queen. That it's her regnal name, right? That is her enthroned in her power of prophecy and foretelling, weaver of fate, and sorcery and magic and all of that. Whereas Danu, she is just a mother goddess of the earth. That, that is her, her nature. When talking to her as Danu, I'm talking about that mother goddess, that earth mother goddess that flows in the wind and flows in the water. Because da Danu comes from the word that means flowing. And so in a lot of ways in my head, when I visualize her, it's kind of like the life stream from Final Fantasy X. Like she is just that life that's just flowing through everything. But when she's the Morrigan, she is the Morrigan. And I'm not the only person. This isn't original to me. A lot of people tend to have that belief. And eventually for a lot of people that just may be, we just say it without any of these caveats that, yeah, Danu is the Morgan. The Morgan is Danu. But that is an evolution of the mythology should that happen because of our experience with, with this. And if you disagree, if Danu is a completely separate spirit to you, yay, I, I'm not going to fight you on that. And that's how this has to work. That's how we build this community together is we have to share and be willing to let other people disagree with us. I have a devotion as a saint, like it's a full blown, like the way I would relate to a Catholic saint. I light candles to him. I say prayers to him. I have kind of done the icon practices of sitting with and conversing with to Emperor Akbar of the Mughal Empire. I have a very strong devotion to Akbar for a lot of reasons. And if you want, let us know in the comments and we can do an entire episode on Emperor Akbar if you want. I also have devotion to one of his wives that has many, many names because we all agree on the character of the person, but even ancient, oh, the old sources disagree on what her actual name was. I'm wondering if it was actually several of her, his wives that we, in because we know he did, he did have more than one. So we may be trying to press several of his wives into one person because that's what history does a lot of times, especially mm -hmm. with women. But I try to be very respectful because... I do not practice Dini Elahi. I am familiar with it. I do say some of the prayers from it. I am not a Shiite Muslim, which is technically what he was. I do not have the devotion to any of these Sufi saints that he did, though I am fascinated by some of them and have read some of them. But I do have a connection with him. And so I bring him in. I tend not to make a distinction between the saints that I worship and the gods that I do. They kind of all end up on the same shelf together. That's my practice. That's not necessarily your practice. The one thing I will say is I try to give equal respect to all of them. And especially in a day and age like this, where we are all developing these very eclectic faiths. Like I'm sitting here talking to you and right in front of me is my Salvatrix Mundi, which is a feminine Jesus as a savior of the world. I have a image of Fr Frigid, Morgan, Caridwin, Mother Mary, Martha, and my sweet, sweet elephantine helper, Ganesh. Like, all within such side of me, and that's just, and I stopped naming. There are other things that I can name. Lith is there, Siddhartha's right there. Like, I could keep naming. The, they are all part of my personal pantheon, and I have respect for all of them. A lot of it boils down to that living in right relationship. Yeah. It's not a matter of how many. It's a matter of, are you able to live in right relationship with the ones that you're trying to live with, the ones that you have in your life. Because we kind of subtitled this episode, The Faith That Never Dies, because I don't believe that any religion has ever really died off. Like, we can talk about how few people practice Zoroastrianism today because of the people that claim that name for themselves. But if you are Jewish or Christian, you are practicing a reformed version of Zoroastrianism because that whole army of light and darkness, good, bad dichotomy that the idea of an apocalypse, an end of the world, all that came from Zoroastrianism into Christianity and Judaism, sorry, and Judaism, and is foreign initially to them, right? A lot of 
the angel names that we have, a lot of the demon names that we have are from, from Zoroastrianism. We need to start having a much more evolutionary idea about religion and spirituality because none of them really die. They just kind of interbreed and parts live on. Like all of, to all of the Gnostics that are listening to my voice right now, you're all practicing Neoplatonic religion. Like that's Alexandrian Neoplatonic religion. It just got dressed up in Christian words or Jewish words, depending on which version of Gnosticism you're, pra you're practicing, right? Nothing, nothing ever really dies. And this idea that one religion supplanted another, no, Lutherans are more Germanic in their practice than Italians are, and Italians are more Roman in their practice because a lot of that folk practice got mixed in. And once we can accept that about the pre-existing boxed faiths, then as we're constructing our own altars and our own faith, I don't want to say it gives us permission because again, I don't feel like we need permission, but it makes us feel like we are part of a tradition that has always been here and not something that's new. We know for centuries, people had their favorite gods and saints on the same altar and we still do today. So thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. What? Non-traditional saints. Let's put it that way. Are, do you have on your altar or in your heart? Do you, who, who do you work with? I would love to know. You leave us a comment if you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube right there. Or if you're listening to us anywhere else, even if it says that you can leave a comment, they don't tell us. So leave, an, leave a comment there because engagement is magic. And then head over to creationspast.com. Click on chat and you can leave a comment there. and We won't be able to see it and respond. I, I would love to know. While you're over there, if you have a few dollars you can pass our way, you can think of joining the membership, or you can support us on Patreon or Ko-fi. I am seed or spawn both. And through Ko-fi, you can even do one-time gifts, if that's something you'd be interested in. That money helps us to keep food on our table, a roof over our head, and the power on. So thank you so much to everybody who does that. Y'all are amazing. And know that you actually are in my prayers. I don't like including that as a but that I feel like that's weird to add as a bonus. Like I, I did not become a Catholic priest, but it feels very so Catholic to have like sign for five dollars we'll put you at our book of prayer. Yeah. It's so Catholic to me that I can't bear my red say it's a bit you know, you are in our prayers. Um if you don't have any money to to donate at this time, that's perfectly all right. But if any of our episodes have meant something to you, share them to other people. That helps us out more than you know. And as we're heading out. Let's say a prayer to my favorite dog hey, headed saint, Saint Christopher. Who's a good boy? I'm no, okay, I'm trying today. Oh, I always want to do that. It's okay. Belly rubs for the saint. Belly rubs for the saint. Uh, uh, oh, blessed Saint Cr Christopher who guides all people through their times of trial into the dangers of life. Help us as we navigate through all of the challenges that will be facing us in the next couple of years and help us to find our way to a good and safe home. Amen. Amen.